Welcome to the Cycling in Alignment podcast, an examination of cycling as a practice and dialogue about the integration of sport and right relationship to your life. Hello there, space monkeys. Welcome to 2024 million billion. It's taken me a while to get back behind the mic. Things are happening. Stuff is moving. Energy is evolving as will happen. And I've been working on my website and my business and things at the home, the house, visit from my daughter, visit from some family. And these things, well, we take time to respect those processes, process I, and be in the moment because you can't just work all the time. This is not how it goes. This is living out of balance. And if I can't live my life in balance, how am I going to be a coach for anyone else? How am I going to tell someone else to have more balance in their life if I can't do that for myself? Hmm. I'm eating a piece of dark chocolate. Alter Eco 85% cacao. Classic blackout. Organic. I don't mean much of it in my life. But a little piece now and then helps. Plus, it's delicious. So rather than have an afternoon coffee, I'm having a little bit of dark chocolate to give me some focus and linear thought because linear thought is important in podcasts. It helps me make points to you. And recently, I've come across some scientists, some people who are very invested in the world of scientism. Yet again, these These types of individuals keep coming across my radar and I find them endlessly fascinating. So more on that later. Let me preview this episode for you. This is going to be a solo pod. You probably guessed that by now because I haven't introduced a guest. And I'm going to bounce around a bit, but really this is a QA and a or the A's to people's Q's as it were. Because I've had a lot of emails and DMs and things like that. So I'm just going to run through these and offer people some bits and bobs. I also just have some notes from conversations with clients, from emails with people who didn't necessarily email me about the podcast, but I thought were relevant. And I'm going to just run through them and, and make these points and answer these questions. And hopefully you will find this useful. Many of these are about bike fitting. Some of them are about coaching. All of them are about life. The first thing, I'll start with simple stuff. When you go to your bike fitter or when you're reasonably serious about your bicycle practice, here's a thing you must do. Those of you who know me know I don't like to tell people what to do, but I'll break that rule in this case and I will tell you, you must do this. You have to have a relationship with your equipment. And there are certain terms to that relationship. And if you don't respect those terms, then you will invite challenge. This is the way it works. What do I mean by this? I mean that you have to kind of understand the very, very basics of how a bike works. Now, I'm not saying that to be a bike rider or a bike racer, you have to be a mechanic. Those are two different things. And as Paul reminded me at IMS5 in the fall, bees do not make honey alone. What does he mean by that? He means that you can't do everything yourself and stop trying to take the weight of the world on your shoulders. That might be when one way to interpret that. So when I say bees don't make honey alone, what I'm saying is don't try to necessarily be your own bike mechanic in totality. Know when to hire help, but you should know some basics, some fundamentals. You should know how to change a tire. If you're out on a ride and you get a flat, you shouldn't be helpless and have to Uber back home. You should know some basic mechanical adjustments and have an idea of how long your derailers are going to stay charged. These types of things, know where to plug them in, etc. Know how to lube a chain, know how many pounds of pressure you should be putting in your tires. Uh, have an idea of when your chain is worn out or when your brake pads are worn out. Have some concept of when these things are at least worn out so you can take them to the shop and have someone work on them and replace them. 
And one of the more relevant to bike fitting aspects are the condition of your cleats and pedals. Uh, late in 2023, I had a run of clients who came in who had disastrous pedals and cleats. And I'll tell you from personal experience that the curious thing about cycling, there are certain ways in which we want play in the human body. And there are other ways in which we do not. And I can tell you what they are. At the foot, we want play in the transverse plane. We do not want play in the frontal plane. What does that mean? So there, from a Cartesian perspective, there are three planes of movement in the human body. So if you think of a person standing, we can define these three planes and we have to imagine you moving in those planes and you'll get the idea. So when I say we do not want movement in the frontal plane, if you were standing up and you put your arms over your head and you did a cartwheel, that would be moving in the frontal plane. So the axis of rotation around which you moved might be your belly button or thereabouts, right? But your hands and your feet would be traveling in a circular pattern if you did a cartwheel. And the movement would be to the side, we'll say, to your left side or your right side, depending on which way you did the cartwheel. And if you did a perfect cartwheel, you might be able to do one uh, right next to a wall and not touch the wall with your backside. So that would be perfect movement in the frontal plane, we'll say. And so now imagine the foot on the pedal and imagine it rocking left to right. So your big toe would go down towards the ground and your little toe would go up and vice versa. Your little toe would go down towards the ground. Your big toe would go up. That'd be rocking in the frontal plane, right? The axis of rotation would be lengthwise along the foot, just as the axis of rotation in your, in your cartwheel would be lengthwise through your belly button. And this is bad. And I'll explain why I think that is in a moment. What we do want is rotation in the transverse plane. Now the transverse plane is sort of the opposite of the frontal plane. That is to say the axis of rotation would be straight up and down the middle of your body as though it was parallel to or on top of your spine. So it'd be a vertical rod. And so rotational uh, you could also call transverse rotation rotational, I suppose, would be a colorful adjective way to a colorful, a colorful adjective you could apply to that concept. Um, what's the best way to explain transverse rotation? I suppose it would be swinging a baseball bat would be an example or a tennis racket. When you swing the bat, you're, you're more or less swinging it in the transverse plane and the axis of rotation is, well, you could say it's the glenohumeral joint for part of the movement, and you could say it's the torso for part of the movement, right? But you get the idea. It doesn't really matter exactly where the axis is. The bat pretty much swings more or less parallel with the horizon. I mean, that's probably not true. I'm not a baseball player, but more or less. And so for a thought experiment, we can pretend that that's the case. And we do want play in this plane on when your foot is in a cleated shoe and a bicycle. Now, why do we want plane in one plane and not in the other? Oh, in case you're wondering, the third plane, we'll, we'll address that first, is the sagittal plane. And we do have sagittal plane around two axes when we're pedaling a bicycle, right? So the sagittal plane, the, the movement would be, um, you might describe it as fore and aft. So it's the movement that your legs do when you're running and walking. It's the movement that we do when we're cycling. It's the, it's the pattern of movement of your, of your limbs, your lower limbs. And sagittal plane would be like a toy soldier marching forward, arms and legs moving forward and backwards, forward and backwards. So the movement is in that plane. And then the axis of rotation would be, uh, depending on which joint you're talking about, could be through the knee, could be through the hip right? From one hip, from the left hip to the right hip. If you drew a line through the center of those two joints and extended it out on either sides of the body, an imaginary line, then you would have the axis of rotation of your hips and the movement would be in the frontal plane and the axis of rotation would be perpendicular to that, right? Hopefully that's clear. So of course, most exercise we do is dominantly in the sagittal plane, right? Running is in the sagittal plane, walking, um, 
Cycling certainly is. And whenever we're seated at a desk, we're basically moving in the sagittal plane to sit down and then we're stationary and then we move in the sagittal plane to get up more or less. So we have sagittal plane movement in cycling. That's what it is. And we have two axes of rotation, at least really probably three, one at the ankle, one at the knee and one at the hip. And all of those joints uh, have movement about them while we pedal. Now there's other movement that happens in cycling and micro movements. And to be clear, uh, there are some biomechanists and other people in the movement industry who would say that all joints are triplanar, whereas there are other people who would say that there are some joints that are only uh, monoplanar or move in one plane. So a good example of that is the, well, to contrast is the hip and the knee. So if you stand up and you stand on one leg and then you take the other leg, you can move your thigh in a circle. You can move it fore aft. You can move it in the sagittal plane, the transverse plane and the frontal plane. You can move it in all those planes because your hip is really kind of like a ball and socket joint from a very mechanistic standpoint. And the knee is a little bit more like a hinge joint, right? Primarily it likes to move in the sagittal plane. Now the truth is your mo- your knee can move in the other two planes as well. Just not nearly as much. The, the movement of the knee in the frontal and transverse planes is very reduced in comparison to the frontal, the, excuse me, the sagittal plane. And one of the ways in which we bulletproof our knees is to actually move it in other planes. There's a hint for you. So in fact, there's a Qigong exercise I do most mornings called listening to the knees, which does exactly this. It's basically knee rotations. So we want the foot to move in certain ways and not in others. And here's my theory on this. And before you ask, I have absolutely no science to back this up. No mercury with chalk to be found. No elixirs, no triple blind placebo controlled studies with radioactive isotopes. These things do not exist. And if you ask me all the good stuff that we know, is stuff that you can't find out in double blind studies. Not all of it. I'll I'll retract that statement. I'll modify it and then spit it back out. The vast majority of. So when we watch the movie Inception, this is my own theory. This is off the wall. I'm giving you full warning. You've been noticed. Uh, I'm giving you notice. You've been notified. When we watch Inception, And Leonardo DiCaprio has a dream within a dream within a dream. How do we wake up from these dreams in our fictional movie? We fall. Why do we wake up from dreams in which we fall? Or you might say nightmares. I think that we have to consider evolutionary biology. And I'll speak with the awareness and the transparent statement that I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I've studied some things and I know some stuff. So I may be way the hell out of my zip code here, but I'm going to say it anyway, because that's what we do. We say things and then we figure out if they're right or wrong. Okay. What was our strategy as if we sat down and played chess? We were quadrupeds at one point and we became bipeds. And when we did that, we took a huge risk, a huge evolutionary risk. We went from four points of contact to two. We reduced our base of support and became inherently less stable. Why would we do this? Uh, We also exposed our internal organs to threat, right? When you're on all fours and uh, you approach another animal that's trying to eat you or hurt you, you've got not as much surface area and certainly not as much critical surface area facing that direction. But when you stand up, you've got all your viscera exposed, your heart, your lungs, your neck. And you notice that when people get scared, they retreat into this red light position, this reactive position. And part of that is to immediately go into spinal flexion. That's to start to protect their organs and their neck. That's part of what's hardwired into us. So We took this evolutionary risk. We went from quadruped to biped. We stood up. We got sweat glands. We got rid of most of our body hair. We became persistence hunters. 
And now we can stalk a herd of antelope for nine hours until four in the afternoon when they're totally overheated and they're like, fuck it, I'm dead. And they just roll over and then we kill them or drive them into a box canyon or use our tools and our opposable thumbs to make weapons and then kill them. Sorry for this noise here. The foil was exceptionally resistant to my opposable thumbs. So when we did this, we put our big brains on top of our spinal cords and we got really good vision. We could see long distances so we can scan the threat for prey and predators. And we also got big brains so we could track our antelope herds. And we became the worst sprinters in the animal kingdom by a good margin. But then we had really good tracking systems. So we kind of made up for that. And then we had tools. So we, we gained, that was our evolutionary edge. We, we traded out some things, but we gained some advantages, right? So when this happened, we, one of the risks we took was that we, we perched ourselves up much higher, right? We probably tripled our effective height, right? When you're on all fours and then you stand up, you're about three times taller than you are when you're crawling around on the floor. And that requires exceptional balance. And it requires feet and ankles that are strong and stable. And cyclists tend to not have strong and stable feet. So our feet became a crucial part of our interaction with the environment. And our nervous system had to be finely and accurately attuned to our stability on any given walking surface at any moment. Because if you fall down and break an ankle or a femur or a hip, you are dead to the tribe and then you're probably a hyena snack or an African painted dog snack or whatever. Watch if you are so inclined an Instagram account called nature is metal. If you want to see how terrifying African painted dogs are, they're the scariest animals on the planet. <clears throat> uh, be warned. If you watch this channel, it's both addictive and brutally violent, but it's real. So, When we walk on the surface of the earth, we have to be acutely aware of our environment and of our, the condition of the ground we're walking on, we'll say the surface that uh, on which we're engaging. This is one of the biggest problems with leather coffins or hokas, or as a client recently pointed out, I should really be battling on shoes because they are the squishiest of the squish just about. And these are these are accommodations for a, a modern world in which we live where we walk around on concrete. Of course, we weren't made to do that. So there are, there are accommodations we have to make to live in, in society. But these shoes are a disaster. They make your feet so weak and they tune down the sensitivity we have to the environment. I, this, is, this is a problem in our world, right? Let me just segue for a second here. Like human beings are destroying themselves by their exposure to LEDs and computer screens and monitors that are have all the wavelengths turned to the wrong dials and too much blue light, not enough sunlight, not enough clean air. I'll try not to rant here, but we also assault our senses, specifically our sense of smell with all these chemicals and perfumes. And this is a thing that I've always felt strongly about. And then I did the podcast with Ashley Frazier and back to basics. And it just reinforced these points. Like stop using deodorant and air fresheners, people there. I'm telling you what to do again. Stop using fabrics softeners with perfumes in it. This stuff is toxic poison. And the fact that people don't immediately intuit that this is toxic poison is a bit crazy making for me because it's obvious. Like, just sit with it for a minute. When you smell some of the odors that come out of people's dryer sheets, there's nothing on earth that smells like that. And the further, what is our number one rule? It's that we must live by. The further you are from nature, the more harm will come to you. This is correct. So modern padded shoes are making things worse. As I've said on my podcast before, I do believe that foam is evil. Foam and fleece. Fleece is evil. Micro fleece is evil. I mean, come on. 
Where do you think microplastics come from? <laughs> Mostly from fleece. Stop buying cheap fleece jackets, please. So we we live in this world with our dulled senses and our feet are, we think of them as crude appendages that maybe occasionally get pedicures and sometimes stink when you don't wash your gym shoes frequently enough and are things that you stuff into a cycling shoe to be the end point of force when you smash pedals. This is, this is, I would say how most people conceive of feet. The reality is feet are sensory organs. And when they are working correctly, they will tell you a lot about your environment. So if you're not walking barefoot through the world, at least sometimes, you're missing out on a lot of things. And you're also deconditioning your body. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this is not a good future cast because, well, okay, look at Peter Atia's work. Peter, if you don't know who Peter Atia is, go forth and make the, the keyboard mudras. Peter is, he's a science guy. He's, he's fully gripped by scientism. No judgment there. He's on his path. He's doing his thing. He's well known. He's got his books and his podcast and he, he references all the data. He's a, a doctor and he works primarily in cancer, cancer research and treatment. And so, well, not re, he's not a researcher, I don't think. So he was a an emergency in ER doc for a long time. And he talks about this in his book and Peter, Peter future casts for, for his clients. And he asked them, you know, what do you want to do when you're 80 or 90? And then he does an assessment of their physical condition. I'm not one of his patients. So I'm going off what he says in his books and his podcasts, he assesses them and does blood work and some other things. And then he gives them a, a status report state of the nation. And he explains to them what their biggest challenges are in terms of how their physical performance or their, their health span, as opposed to lifespan, two different points will degrade over the next five, 10, 20, 30 years. And he asks them what their goal is, you know, oh, my goal is to still travel to, you know, the beach in Mexico, or I don't know, wherever they want to go. People want to go to Italy and they want to play with their great, great grandkids. So he can calculate how much strength you need to lift up your 12 pound grandkid and those kinds of things, or your suitcase into the overhead bin. And then he looks at statistics on how people die. And he's got his list of the four horsemen. So if you don't get taken by blunt force trauma, which is like a car accident, or you're not shot by some nut job at a supermarket or something who decided to go crazy with a rifle, and you don't get attacked by a lion or eaten by a bear or um, smushed by a piano. Sorry, this is the way my brain works. Uh, Then you are likely statistically to get claimed by one of the four horsemen. And if I get these right, I think it's metabolic disorder, which is basically Alzheimer's, uh, cardiovascular disease. um, Oh, drat. I'm going to mess this up now. Should have written these down first. Uh, cardiovascular disease would include heart failure, heart attack, right? Um, adult onset, basically diabetes or complications of diabetes, I believe is the third one. And the fourth one is just, is it metabolic disorder or is that, I can't remember. Sorry, I'm, I'm butchering this. In any case, Peter's got his four horsemen and those are statistically the things that claim most people. I think I covered most of that more or less. I might've smushed it a bit. And then the last category is how does grandma or grandpa die? Well, if they don't get claimed by one of those, statistically what happens is they fall. And after they fall, their life, quality of life goes down a lot, right? So, and this is because when you're an elderly person, it's harder to recover from these types of traumas, especially if you break a femur or break your hip or break an arm, right? Uh, you, you wipe out when you're going out to get your morning paper on a little bit of ice or sand. And what is the cause of that? Well, we could say that it's fundamentally the cause is you had unstable feet and ankles, right? So um, we could break it down a little more than that, but you have to have good balance. You have to have good intrinsic arch stability and foot stability, ankle stability. You have to have good foot reaction speed. So 
and you have to be, you have to have good balance, like not only within your feet, but you have to have good balance, be aware. You have to be cognitively aware and sort of reactive in your head. You got to kind of have a good proprioceptive sense of where your body is you know, when you're walking in an uneven surface. And so if you spend years and years of your life walking around in really well padded shoes and you never walk on the grass barefoot or on stone barefoot or God forbid on concrete barefoot or, you know, a trail barefoot, or at least in minimal shoes that help engage you with the environment a little more and also work the muscles, the feet, the fascia of the feet, et cetera, build up the the fat pads, but also build up the capacity to sense the environment through your feet. If you don't do this, then these appendages aren't going to be much good. I mean, it's, you know, the oldest rule on the planet. If you don't use it, you will lose it. Is that a serious question? No. So we have to use our feet and we have to have strong feet and ankles. And I can tell you, it's quite common for me to see cyclists who come into my fit studio who have dreadful foot and ankle stability, dreadful, like a two out of 10. Why? Because when you're on a bike, you're using modern cycling shoes, the world's best invention. Thank you, Specialized, for bringing us the stiffness index of 13 out of 10. And what the fuck does that mean? Seriously? You guys got to turn down the marketing bullshit. So we all think that we're cool because we ride around in carbon fiber shoes and they're so stiff and these stiff levers. What these stiff levers are doing is in fact weakening our feet and ankles because we are conditioning everything above that. The hips, the knees, the hamstrings. Sorry, we're not really. Yeah, we are conditioning our knees. I'll say that. We're conditioning the muscles above the ankle of the lower limb. But we're allowing the muscles in the feet and ankles to be assisted by a lever. And if we add a stiff orthotic on top of that, we're compounding our problems. So the problem is the delta in conditioning between the foot and ankle and the rest of the system. This is always the problem. It's the delta relative to what is the question we ask. So you have well-conditioned muscles in some respects and poorly conditioned in others, but they're all part of the same system because nothing is actually individual. When you walk and run, do you only use your calves? Do you only use your hamstrings? No, use your whole leg and your hip and your actually your torso and your lat and the contralateral arm. And this is how you walk. Use almost every muscle in your body when you walk. You use almost every muscle in your body when you ride, probably just about everyone, especially when you go hard. Don't believe me? I'll do a little video and show you later. So we want movement in, I'm coming back to movement. We want movement in the transverse plane, but we do not want movement in the frontal plane. Why? Because Leonardo DiCaprio falls. What? Makes sense, Pierce. So what I'm saying is when you step with your foot on the ground and your foot tips in a way that the first metatarsal, that's the ball, the big foot drops down. Like imagine that you're walking down the stairs sideways and you misstep slightly and one foot is halfway on the step and halfway on the, off the step. And you're in the dark, so you didn't see it and you're not expecting it. You're expecting a flat surface, or I'm sure we've all done this where we get to the bottom of the staircase and we think that there's one more step and there's not, and we hit the floor. We try to step down for a step, but we hit the floor instead or vice versa. We get to the bottom of the staircase and we think that we're at the floor, but there's actually one more step. And either way, those are both quite alarming to the nervous system. There's an immediate central nervous system response and, uh, a, a very quick reaction to that change in environment. So this is why falling is so critical for us. It's primarily rooted into our survival mechanisms to be on on level ground and not fall off of stuff because we took a huge risk when we decided to go from quadruped to biped. And now we have to navigate that risk and one of the ways we do that is by installing a safety system. It's like when you bought a new giant house that cost you $6 million because you live in Boulder and then you decide to put an alarm system in it. Especially if you move from a less dangerous place to a more dangerous place, you're going to get an alarm system, right? I'm making up a 
thought experiment just to illustrate the point. That's what the central nervous system effectively did. It fired up the alarm system. And it does this so that we don't trip and fall and break our femur. But in order for that system to work, we have to have active, strong feet that are used to working in the environment. This is part of the equation. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So on the bike, when we pedal, if we push down and the shoes and cleats are totally smoked, what immediately happens, you get all this play in the frontal plane. And this incidentally is why I'm not generally a fan of look pedals because Often, depends on the shoe you're using, but often brand new look cleats and pedals will have a way too much play in the frontal plane for me, for my preference. Also, some of the new Wahoo pedals and cleats will do the same thing. There's a hack for that. It's a pain in the ass. You can do it. But we do not want play in the frontal plane. You want that to be, that connection to be as tight as possible. However, we all want, or I'll say almost all, all with an asterisk, We all want play in the transverse plane, everyone except perhaps a world tour level sprinter. So the only people who have business riding completely fixed cleats are people who are sprinters and make their living riding a bike. Everyone else just put freaking play at your heel and let your foot be where it's going to be and work on your function. If you have excessive heel in or heel out while you're pedaling or in particular asymmetrical heel in and heel out left to right then your task is to work on your spiral pattern. See my previous podcast for an explanation on that. And the function of your adductor, abductor, abductor relationships, that is your external internal rotation of the hips, relationship with the SI joints, and other biomechanical factors to stay within the biomechanical model for a moment. You got to optimize the relationship of the bike. The reality is if you're a cyclist, you fell in love with a relatively symmetrical machine and you are an asymmetrical biological creature. And part of the task of relating to your bike is to make yourself be able to have some sense of symmetry. It's just what's up. So that was a really long way to say, freaking check your cleats and pedals. And people don't quite know how to do this. So I'm going to walk you through it real quickly. But make sure they're in really good shape and err on the side of, yeah, I bought new cleats because I wasn't sure. Don't, a lot of people come to me with look or Shimano cleats and they ask if they should get new ones and they're fine. They've just are scratched up from walking around on them. So that's not an indication of where the indication of where is the play in the frontal plane. So here's how you do this. You put your bike in the trainer or you put it, you just, lean it against a wall and you get on it. So you hold yourself up on the wall or the desk or whatever, and you clip your shoe in, and then you take your foot out of the shoe, leaving your shoe clipped into the pedal. And then you can just grab the shoe, put the crank at three o'clock, the drive side at three o'clock, and then grab the shoe and then twist it. You can twist the heel left to right. That's your transverse plane. You're checking the play of the cleat. There should be some in most systems, right? Depending on which cleats you have. If you have the fixed cleats, there won't be any play there. And then the task is to try to figure out where your optimal foot angle is without any reference. This is challenging. That's why I recommend most people use cleats with float. Again, unless you're a sprinter making your paycheck in the sport. Then grab the shoe with both hands and rock it in the frontal plane. So try to make the inside of the shoe dip down towards the ground and try to make the outside dip up, et cetera, and vice versa. And just watch and feel how much play is there in there. And this applies to mountain bike shoes too. And more so in some ways, because when you wear the lugs down on your mountain bike shoes, that usually makes the play in the frontal plane really bad. So your task is to make sure that your shoes are in good shape. Your cleats are in good shape. Your pedals are in good shape. And if there's more than a couple mils of play in there, there's noticeable play to the point where you are your foot is tipping in that frontal plane by a degree or more, you absolutely need new cleats and possibly new pedals. How often should I replace my cleats and pedals? Well, my answer is do this test, find out. But once a season for most people is minimum. Depending on the types of cleats you have, depending on what kind of riding you do, what kind of conditions you do, how clean you keep your bike, how much walking you do on your look cleats or Shimano cleats. 
If you're tromping around on those things, then that'll do it. If you keep your bike in the garage, then have a pair of flip flops by the door or winter boots or whatever, and walk out to the garage in those and keep, and then bring your shoes out and change in the garage. You don't need to walk around in your cycling shoes. They're not walking shoes. They're cycling shoes. That was a really long way to say that it's, it's a small detail, but it was a really long way to say, keep your shoes and cleats in good condition, small, um, but not trivial detail. Okay. That's point one that I wanted to bring up because I have had so many athletes come in, uh, and ask me about whether they should wedge. And when they come in and they've got three degrees of play in the frontal plane of their cleats and shoes on their own, wedging is irrelevant. I have no idea how much wedging you need air quotes, but I don't really like, I, I have done a podcast on wedging before, and I'm just want to briefly unpack this. I don't really like wedging generally wedging. All wedging is an accommodation. Now, sometimes accommodations are useful and even recommended, but in most instances, they are not because I want your foot to be strong and stable on its own. I want it to have good arch integrity. I want good firing of the, the muscles that stabilize, build the arch and dome the arch inside ankle bone high in most cases unless you're a supinator. And I want people to have good control over their ankle stability under load. In order to propagate this, you don't do this with wedging. Wedging, it's a combination, right? You can't just jack your foot up to correct it. So what is the issue with wedging? There's two problems, okay? So let's say that someone is, uh, they've got not great arch integrity. So they've got very flat feet. And so they're overpronated, right? This would be the medial ankle bone. The inside ankle bone would be moving towards the crank arm. And strangely, this can result in either toe in or toe out. Those aren't necessarily correlated, but most of the time we would probably see a toe out heel in when someone's really pronated. That'd be the more common pattern. And so when we have this, this flattened arch, right? This lack of integrity, this, this stretched out plantar fascia of the foot. That's the, the fascia lines on the underside of the foot are all stretched and long. They don't have enough integrity in them or enough strength, enough shortness. When we have this, then we get this lack of, of sort of power transfer to the pedal. And we can see the inside ankle bone is collapsing and we can see the foot is not in alignment. And we usually get an internal rotation of the femur in that's coupled with this, right? Not always, but often. And this is called a medial rotational instability, right? So we get a medial, we get an internal rotation of the femur, an external rotation of the tibia or the lower leg, and then an internal rotation of the foot. And everything's just twisted out of shape. Now, that's a common outcome. If we put a bunch of wedging at the foot and the inside ankle bone is already smashed in, we're going to, what happens is the outside of the ankle bone becomes compressed and the inside is stretched. Hopefully that's sort of obvious. So if you sort of put your foot on the ground and smash the inside ankle bone towards the ground, you can feel maybe that the inside ankle bone, the area around that would be longer and the area on the outside of the foot be shorter. So at first it seems like a good idea to put some wedging under the foot with a thicker side towards the crank and to straighten that foot out. But here's the problem. Why is the foot like this? Well, when you run, walk, or cycle, where does the power come from? Does the power come from the ankle? Well, no. The power originates from the muscles that move the hip joint and the knee joint, well above that chain. And it's the nature of the force that is causing the foot to collapse right? Now there can be some secondary factors to that. If you walk around in padded shoes all the time, then that's propagated poor foot posture and your foot has lost its tensegrity over time, right? And so then the arch flattens and that's a result of poor footwear or poor management of foot ground relationships. So there can be some of both that are 
we'll say, responsible for this outcome of this collapsed arch and this medial rotation. But how do we manage it? Well, if we put arches under there, is that going to restore integrity of the arch? Well, really what that's doing is effectively smashing the ground further. It's putting more force medially into the foot. And you already have an excessive medial force load on the foot. When you smash your arch into the ground, what you're doing is smashing the first metatarsal. That's the the area under the big toe, the ball of the big toe, into the ground, right? So when we smash the 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 first metatarsal into the ground, are we going to correct that by adding more stuff under that first metatarsal? We might superficially align the foot, but what are we doing to the pressure points? We're actually ramping them up in the wrong way. So let me make this clear to explain. The ideal is to have relatively even pressure amongst the three points of the foot, the three primary contact points, which is the, we can think of the, the foot as a tripod. And the tripod we're looking for is e- equal pressure between the fifth metatarsal, the first metatarsal, and the base of the calcaneus. So the fifth metatarsal is the base of the pinky toe, the first metatarsal is the base of the first toe, and then the calcaneus is the heel bone, right? We want relatively even pressure under those three points. So when you have a compressed arch, you have mostly pressure in the first metatarsal. What happens when we put a big wedge under the first metatarsal? You get more pressure under the first metatarsal. See how this is not solving the problem? Now, that's an attribute of that outcome. But how do we change the outcome? Well, we restore integrity of the arch by having the foot learn to react to the ground and building arch integrity. And that's a whole chapter on foot exercises and walking barefoot and progression to minimal shoes and things like that. But then we also change the nature of the way the force is made up the chain at the hip and at the knee. Because the the way the force comes, we'll say originates from those joints and is transmitted down the lower leg into that foot is what caused initially that medial collapse. That in combination with a weak, lazy foot. Those are, in most instances, that's what causes the whole problem. So wedging doesn't solve this. In fact, it arguably makes it worse but it makes it look maybe a little bit tidier biomechanically from if you've got some cheesy laser, you're pointing at somebody's knees or something. But in my experience, it doesn't even really work there. It just puts more strain on the ankle joint, right? So it we've got this medial ankle joint that's got this length to it and the lateral one that's squished. And then we put the wedge under there and it sort of tries to align the ankle, but nothing really happens. All it does is just sort of ramp up the pressures on those fascial pinch points. I'm going to take a brief pause to turn on my sauna. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Okay. So that was a bit of a technical conversation about that stuff. Hopefully that's useful to people. And hopefully it's a good explanation as to why I don't really prefer to wedge. So next I want to talk briefly about coaching and specifically about coaching for races. Um, chocolate, Mm, dark chocolate. So often I get questions from athletes about strategy and they want to know when they should attack. Most of the time, this is the wrong question. They want to know things about pacing. They want to have an idea of how to handle a race. And I understand bike racing is an intimidating thing, especially if you're not too experienced at it. It can become quite overwhelming to think about how things are going to play out. We're looking for some sense of predictive security. Like what do I expect in a bike race? And we can't always answer that question. This is what's beautiful about bike racing is it's such a complex interaction of physics, weather, psychology, unpredictable events, and I think I cover and physiology that 
we don't really know. There's such a, a complex interplay between those variables. We have no, really no idea how the race is going to turn on on any given day. That's what makes it beautiful. That's why it's not a freaking fitness contest. Like if you want to eliminate all that crap, just go race on Swift. Jesus, boring as hell. Or go do a marathon. Uh, you know, slightly more interesting than Swift, but only marginally in my opinion. So no offense to any marathoners out there. Like there's some amazing athletes who do that stuff and I have never raced a marathon. So I can't speak as to how hard they are and probably would learn a lot if I did, but it's not on my list right now. So when we think about the lens through which we consider a bike race and we, we get to the point where we're slightly more advanced in our tactical perspective, we might consider the lens through which we view our racing in terms of the psychology of the group, right? So do you think of a bike race as really a fitness competition? Meaning, do you hold the belief that the strongest rider should win a bike race? Okay. If you do, do you mean, do you think all that applies to all bike races or only time trials? And when you think that, is that sort of, are you wielding the sword of justice? Do you, do you think that that's a worthwhile uh, attribute for an athlete to have to be the strongest athlete? Because I can tell you there are many things that predict an outcome of a bike race. And yes, the engine size is one of them, but it's only one of several factors. And I'm definitely going to do a podcast that unpacks my list and draws a Venn diagram of what I think those relationships are in the future. Because that will be, I'm going to, I'm going to stab some sacred cows in the face when I do this, this episode, that was a bit of hyperbole, but you get the idea. So I don't, I'm not really going to stab any cows in the face. I'm going to talk to you while I have chocolate in my mouth though. So if you think of cycling bike races as a fitness competition and something that people really the only real business you have showing up to a race is if you're one of the fittest and then you deserve to win. You don't really understand the sport, to be honest. Um, that's a childlike view of the sport. And to be fair, there are people who think the other way around. Uh, they see cycling as an opportunity to almost steal from other people, right? We'll say to be duplicitous in their intent. Now there aren't that many opportunities to do that in bike racing, because if your engine is that bad that you have to be outright duplicitous or nefarious in your intentions, chances are, uh, you're not going to be at the finish line to contest the finish, but every once in a while it happens. But the point I'm getting at is that if you only see cycling as a fitness competition, you're missing the 3d chess element of cycling cycling at a competitive level is really about going to the line with the biggest engine possible and the most fuel in that engine possible, but then also using the fuel and the turbo that you have carefully crafted and trained at exactly the right moment to try to win the race. And that requires tactical acumen. It requires experience. It requires presence, requires concentration. And it also requires an understanding of the rhythm of the race. If we think of the Peloton like a school of fish, or even a swarm of bees, there are times when a swarm of bees can get really quite feisty and whipped up into a frenzy and they will attack the living crap out of you and you might die. There are other times where bees can just be super chill and not care about anything. And this is true of a Peloton also. So there are times when maybe there are attacks going and going and going and going for seemingly long periods of time and no one really gets anywhere. And maybe you want to be participating in those attacks. Maybe you want to be making those attacks. Maybe you're following those attacks, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're just observing and waiting and sometimes when you read the rhythm of the race, there's a magic moment where everyone sort of gives up because they're all collectively pretty tired. 
and you can actually establish a pretty good gap with very little effort if you are looking for that type of moment. And there's nothing there except the presence and awareness of timing and rhythm. All things have rhythm. All things oscillate. All things are based on this pattern of pendulum. And this happens, this, this applies to bike racing too. So the reason I can speak on this is because I definitely use this technique during my career. I use it to my advantage. I use it to make a great many breakaways where I was probably not really the strongest rider in the race or among them. I was pretty average, but I was reading the the rhythm of the race well, and I was able to use that to leverage my strength at the right moment and then leverage a good result out of that. Now, you don't win too many races doing that, but sometimes you can. It, it can definitely happen where you attack at the perfect moment. So I, I wanted to bring this to people's attention because I think that so many people come into a competition, a race, thinking, especially modern cyclists, they're so focused on the engine size. We're so focused on power. We're so focused on threshold specifically, which is only one aspect of power, but we're not thinking about the auxiliary components of a good performance. And this is endlessly frustrating to me as a coach and a cyclist, because we, we have to bring the complete package. This is the way this works, right? This will be a preview of my Venn diagram episode. The engine is the dominant factor, predicting factor, predictive factor in race outcomes, but it is far from the only thing required, right? And the way this Venn diagram works is you've got engine in the middle. That'll be the big thing, or maybe even really, you could argue the dream is the big thing. And then the engine is the biggest component of that. But there are all these other aspects that make up a smaller part of this Venn page of these with all these blobs on it. And if each of these other aspects are not optimized or at least adequate. They may not win you the race, but if they're missing, they can lose you the race. And this is true for 60, 70 different things, right? So examples, uh, pick the wrong tire pressure in a mountain bike race, a cross country mountain bike race. It'll take you out of the race because you'll either crash or you'll be dreadfully slow. Either way, too much pressure or way too little pressure. Either one can be true. Uh, same is true for cyclocross. Less true for road, but still relevant. You can be the strongest guy in a peloton of 150 riders doing a road race and you can't go around a corner to save your life and you crash. Doesn't matter how strong you are. You can be one of the top 10 climbers in a, a hilly road race and a hilly long road race and be in the front group. But if everyone else does a really good job of healing and hydrating and, and you forget to eat and drink for three hours, doesn't matter anymore how strong you are. Totally irrelevant. If your hilly road race has a 10 kilometer stretch, three quarters of the way through that has a rip and side wind and everyone else in the lead group knows how to echelon and you don't, you're bye-bye, you're gone. Right? This is... There's so many examples like this. And so riders, I think are at a bit of a precipice because we are so data focused, so left brained, aramonic oriented, right? It's like, we're so fascinated with technology and things and gizmos right now that we are uh, your focus determines your reality, right? Just like Yoda said. I mean, we're so focused on that. It comes at the expense of attention to other details at times. And this is incorrect. Doing something with mastery requires that you pay attention to all aspects. That you are aware of the multiple faces or yeah, aspects, properties that are required to be present and capable of the task at hand. 
this applies to anything from woodworking to cycling to auto mechanicing to writing, right? How you do one thing is how you do everything. So when we become so data focused that we lose sight of the capacity to do the, the technical aspects of cycling, the skills oriented aspects of cycling, the tactical aspects of riding in a Peloton or forget the wind direction and we rely on engine, this is problematic. Look, I mean, the same thing can happen even at the highest level. Just a few weeks ago, I was at Team of Coaching Camp in Girona, and we had the opportunity to ride with some of the men and some of the women throughout the week. And and I could see, you know, I even had a, a discussion with one of my clients early in camp, uh, a woman who said, yeah, I'm, I'm a really strong rider. She didn't say this. Let me correct. She said, I'm not as good at going through corners. And I had already intuited that this woman was making up for her lack of cornering ability with her strength. So let's unpack this briefly. This is how this works. Like people compensate for their weak areas with their strengths. Why? Because we all want to do what we're good at. So if you're uncomfortable riding in a tight Peloton, for example, or going around corners, you're uncomfortable going around corners at the same speed as most other riders. What happens? The group comes to a corner and you hit the brakes and back out and you lose three bike lengths. But if you're really strong, that's not a problem for you because then you just sprint back up to the group. Now, of course, there'll come a time when your strength will no longer make up that deficit, right? And also your strategy is contingent on the pack, upon the fact that you are one of the stronger riders in the group in which you're riding with or racing with. So that falls apart in two areas. One is when you get to a group where all the riders are as strong as you, then all of a sudden you're in trouble because you can't make up for your lack of cornering with your superior strength in the group. But the second is that now you've got no card to play in the race at all, right? Meaning when you're in the weaker group, you can use your strength to your advantage. And anytime you get uncomfortable, you can rely on your strength to get you out of that hole. So if the group gets really tight or there's a fast pace line or a twisty road, or I'm just making up scenarios and you become uncomfortable. So you back out of the group and you lose some time and then you have to catch back up on the next hill. It's no problem if you're one of the stronger riders. But of course, as soon as the, the group is as strong or stronger than you, now that weakness is exposed and you're out the back. So we, the, the self-reinforcing problem comes when the rider rides with the same people over and over again because they learn how to rely on their strengths and they learn to avoid their weaknesses because we all want to do what we're good at, like I mentioned. So part of your task is to be aware of where you, your limits are in these respects and begin to understand them and improve them pretty simple. The other comment I'll make is on over-reliance on power. And I've talked a lot about this on my podcast before, but I get a, a great number of questions or comments about relying on power or pacing or power, the number of average Watts people should target. And I rarely write training this way. For me, training is about putting out a certain effort and then watching power. It's about, it's about watching power, observing power and heart rate and cadence, and then basing efforts off RPE and then having an understanding of how fitness improves as those relationships change. This is fundamentally what training is about. So The only time I really recommend using a power meter as a pacing device is during time trials. And even then it's with some pretty big caveats because it's fundamentally based on the idea that your model of how many Watts you air quotes should un and end air quotes should be doing. That's a model and models are not always accurate. And there's a human factor that can throw a giant 
wrench in those models. So a great way to think about this relationship is to focus less on power and more on speed. When we're thinking about making it to the top of a climb as fast as we can, or going A to B as fast as we can on a flat road, right? In a time trial, or maybe you're in a race and you're trying to make it to the line as fast as you can, either in a breakaway or by yourself. People tend to assume that more power equals more speed, but this is an oversimplification of physics. Power does not equal speed. It doesn't. Why? What do I mean by that? Well, we have to be a little nuanced and unpack it a touch, but let's take a rolling time trial, for example. Where do you lose and win the most time on the course on the steepest hills? Where is your effort the most wasted on the fastest parts, generally speaking? So if you have a fast downhill that's at 65 or 70 kilometers an hour, I'll let you translate that into miles an hour for those of you who like irrelevant units. Pedaling super hard on those sections on a rolling TT, isn't. it's not going to give you much time relative to the effort you're putting in. Right? So... we have to kind of consider the relationship of power, heart rate, cadence, and torque. And how those four metrics relate to each other to gain, to cover the distance from A to B as fast as possible. And all we're doing is considering the physics of the terrain. It's not a fitness contest. The gradient is not the same the whole time. The wind is not the same the whole time. So in order to understand being speed focused, you need to look at the profile of the course, understand the wind speed versus ground speed, and have an instinct on where to apply more power at the right moment. Even in a timed event, the same rule about not just treating it like a fitness contest, but actually subtly using your power at the right time, that still applies. In fact, it applies even more than ever. Now, I grew up in Colorado where a lot of time trials are just race at go ride for 20 K go around a cone ride back. And there's not a lot of finesse or tactics to those type of time trials. That's true. Basically it's get as arrow as possible and then ride as hard as you can for 40 K. That's more or less the tactic. The only subtlety to that is does the weather change or is there a headwind and a tailwind leg, right? And that will change your tactics slightly, but basically that's it. Uh, it's pretty simple. When you have a situation with a lot more rolling time trials or time trials with technical descents or climbs or, or, you know, especially steep climbs and then less steep climbs, et cetera, then things get a little more interesting because we have to really consider the pacing. But I'm not a big fan of modeling the pacing to death. To me, this is not a useful exercise. What's more useful is to have a deep instinct for the rider to know how hard to go based on how much time is left and how tired they are. And this is a really simple equation in the end. You know, the more you ride your bike and the more you ride your bike fast or hard, you might say, the better instinct you'll have for this type of relationship. And this is in the most essential relationship to develop. This is rule number one for all athletics. Know thyself. Understand your own strengths and your own weaknesses. Understand what you're good at and what you suck at. Improve what you suck at. Use what you're good at at the right moment, otherwise known as train your weaknesses and weaponize your strengths or race your strengths and apply those strengths in the right way at the right time. I hope that's not too vague and not an oversimplification, but these are really important concepts. So I invite you to think about your goal events for this year and think about the type of rider you are and how you might apply your strengths at the right moment during those goals, but also consider for a moment what you're most afraid of. What's the outcome you're most afraid of in that race? And then ask yourself what weakness that indicates. Now ask yourself, 
What can I do? What do I need to do to improve on this weakness? How do I need to dial in my training so that I am as bulletproof as possible when I go to the line in this particular respect? So is it a crosswind section? Is it that you're terrified on downhills and you haven't mastered cornering yet? So you know you can climb with the best, but you can't go down a hill to save your life? Is it, or is it the inverse? Maybe you descend like a demon, but your climbing needs work, right? Be honest with yourself. Look at yourself introspectively and carefully analyze and dissect the aspects of your performance that need the most help and apply one simple rule. If you can't, you must. This is your challenge. I hope that was helpful. That was a bit of a rambling pod, a little bit on the lens of racing, a little bit on wedging cleats, footbeds, and a lecture about keeping your shoes and pedals in good shape. Next time, I'm going to do a bit more about the relationship between heart rate and power. And I will also talk about why all bike fitting is bullshit. Thank you for listening. I hope this wasn't too rambling. I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, later this week, I'm recording with a special guest. We're going to talk about a new movement practice. That'll be exciting. Please, as always, leave me your feedback and your questions on the DMs, and I'll try to trickle them into my Q&A episodes. I was going to do a little more today, but those two have taken up enough time. That's what I got. I will send you some more love later in the future. Thanks for listening. As always, pedal consciously, pedal wisely. Epilogue. I want to share a few brief thoughts about the inception of cycling and alignment. The purpose of this podcast is for me to get three and a half decades of hard fought lessons out of my skull. Some of them through my own research and reading. Some of them I've been taught through mentors and colleagues, other riders, other racers. A lot of it, a massive amount of it was simply trial and error through my own stubborn methods. And that has amassed a certain amount of experience and knowledge, understanding. And while I think I'm reasonably smart and I know quite a bit of stuff, I want to make it clear that the opinions that I share on this podcast are belief systems built on what I've experienced to this point. And that some of those opinions are pretty strong, but they are also loosely held. That is to say that if I learn more about a topic and have a greater level of clarity or understanding, then my old belief systems will be abandoned and I will now operate under that newfound knowledge. So I'm not here to tell people all the things that I know. I'm here to explain what I've learned to this point. And there's a big difference. Also, that is the intent when I discuss things on the pod with guests is to learn from them and have a discourse because if we can't have a discourse as adults then we've lost one of the basic tenets of modern society even if we disagree we ought to be able to in most cases shake hands and walk away because after all this is sport we're talking about and while sport is training for life it's nothing to get too upset over. The purpose of the podcast is to help me help other people and specifically to help them actualize their highest potential by illuminating a path that enables alignment with their truth, their intent, and their coherence. That's really the end goal. So I'm grateful for your listening. My intent is also not to be clear to gain an audience or become popular or gain social status in any way. I don't care about that stuff. That said, if you feel an episode that you have heard will help someone you know, please share it with them. That helps us reach the end goal, which is to help more people. 
Thank you for listening. I'm grateful for your time and attention. Blessings.